Let's go to 2007 or so, uh, before the Munich speech, right in that time. How different is he? How different is that Vladimir Putin from the man who uh, was handed the baton by uh, Yeltsin back in 99? And oh, I think there was a considerable evolution in Putin in some ways over that period of time, um, particularly since the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, which I think Putin saw as a direct threat uh, to his own control in Russia. And the notion that, you know, regime change and what he always saw to be Russia's sphere of influence um, was threatening to his interests. And so there had been a gradual buildup of frustration and anger on his part at what he saw to be, you know, duplicitous behavior on the part of the West and the United States. He always gave us more credit than we deserve for careful conspiracies. But um, I think that was the lead up to the Munich speech, which was kind of a very pugnacious exclamation point on what was a kind of gradually accumulating set of frustrations and grievances on his part. Um, um, I, I go back and I search the archives for quotes about him from Angela Merkel and every, every, they all say madman, lunatic, uh, whatever. Was he that by then? No. If I mean, he was that, if he's that at all. No, Putin, I mean, I think is a very complicated personality. I think he lives in a world in which, you know, the tough get to set the rules and the weak get taken advantage of. Uh, he's a cynic about uh, people around him and sometimes about his own population as well. Control um, is what he attaches the most importance to. He's tactically very agile. Um, he's, you know, quite capable of playing rough and taking calculated risks. I don't think he's a grand strategist, um, and if he is, he hasn't been particularly successful in that in the sense that he's still stuck with a one-dimensional economy, way too dependent on hydrocarbons. If you look at the consequences strategically of, you know, his aggression against Ukraine, he's managed to convince, you know, 42, 43 million Ukrainians that, you know, that they need to sustain their independence. and. Um, you know, ensure that they're not in any way dependent on Russia um, in making their political and economic choices. Uh, but tactically, he's very agile as well. But he's not a madman. I mean, you know, power does corrupt, and he's been in power in Russia a long time, so he's got his blind spots. Um, but, you know, he's uh, very carefully calculating uh, about what he sees to be Russia's interests and how best to pursue them. Let's talk about the Munich speech. Astonishing uh, speech from what I can read and understand about it at the time. How did it feel? Um, well, I, I, I really do think it was a kind of a pugnacious exclamation point on what you could see building over the couple of years before that, and particularly since the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Rose Revolution in Georgia. Putin's worldview um, is that major powers like Russia are entitled to spheres of influence. And he believes that Russia was entitled to have a predominant uh, influence in places like Ukraine. Um, and so he saw you know, what was unfolding in Ukraine as a direct threat, not only to that sphere of influence, but also to the durability of his own regime in Russia. Um, and so he saw this threat building, and he was trying to draw a very public and very pugnacious line at Munich. He was also quite concerned about, you know, the potential for further expansion of NATO. Um, but, you know, in his worldview, which is a very combustible combination of insecurity and grievance and ambition, and which in some ways is born of, you know, uh, the sense of humiliation that lots of Russians felt, amidst all the democratic promise of the 1990s of Yeltsin's Russia, but it was that sense of humiliation, which I think um, you know, very much shaped Putin's view of the world uh, after he became president. Um, he started his relationship with George W. Bush with the famous uh, Bush looking in, in his eyes and seeing his soul and the cross story and all those sort of canards about how, how the relationship got started. By the time Munich happens. What is his 
perspective on Bush personally and the United States? I think his personal relationship was was always a fairly even keeled one with with uh, President Bush forty three, which George W. Bush, at least in you know my experience, is watching them directly. But he had come to the conviction by you know early two thousand seven on the Munich speech that American policy was essentially aimed at undermining him, no matter you know, how cordial his, you know, personal interactions might be with President Bush. Um, and that had built over a period of years. I think, you know, when Putin became president, quite unexpectedly, um, I think he did begin with the notion that he could help engineer uh, the restoration of Russia as a major power, as a kind of partner of the United States. But there was always, at least in my experience, a fairly fundamental disconnect in terms of his outlook and his view of Russia's role in the world and the U.S. role in the world and that notion of equal partnership, which the power realities, you know, would never bear out. And, and so his view was that Russia was entitled uh, to a sphere of influence. Um, that's what major powers uh, got to assert and that um, other major powers should stay out of his business in Russia in terms of how, you know, ec the economic order and the political order was organized as well. And he gradually came to the conviction, you know, as he moved into his second term as president, um, that that wasn't going to work. Um, and, you know, his own frustration and sense of grievance built over that time. Again, uh, I think quite unjustifiably in terms of what American policy was about in those years. But that was his perception, and it was the perception of, you know, lots of people in the Russian political elite in the run-up to the Munich speech. So President uh, Obama gets elected. Hillary Clinton becomes the Secretary of State. Uh, it's reset time. Mm -hmm. Where does the idea, the notion of reset come from, and what is the, what is the, the theory, the big idea? Well, I mean, I think it, um, as is often the case with uh, sort of policy directions, you got to keep it simple. And in the wake of the Georgia War at the end of the summer of 2008, you know, U.S.-Russian relations, Russian relations with the West had sunk to what was at least at that point an all-time low. Um, Cold-bloodedly, um, you know, working with Russia on a number of issues um, served the interests of the United States, whether it was the Iran nuclear issue, which President Obama was you know, quite focused on exploring at least the potential for a diplomatic resolution. Um, Afghanistan, where, you know, as the President Obama began to think about the surge in Afghanistan, it carried with it all sorts of requirements in terms of logistical access and support, not just across Russia, but across, you know, other former Soviet states where Russia had some influence in Central Asia in particular. Um, President Obama was also interested in trying to take uh, nuclear arms reduction to another level. That was, a, you know, one of the big priorities in his campaign. And there again, Russia is the only, you know, nuclear power in the world comparable to the United States had a, you know, both huge capacity and huge responsibility. So cold-bloodedly, there were reasons to explore whether or not, at least in those areas, um, you could build some, you know, hard-nosed form of partnership. And so that was the backdrop to the reset. It wasn't, at least in my experience, born of some illusion that somehow we had missed this possibility for a grand partnership or a grand bargain with Russia. Um, in my experience, Secretary Clinton, President Obama were quite realistic about what was possible and what wasn't. The further complication was that you had a new president in Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, although it never seemed to me that Putin had left power. I mean, he was still obviously calling the shots, and Medvedev's political influence was entirely derivative of Putin's. Um, and so, but that complicated things too, because it made it, it made it more, made it a little bit more difficult to engage directly with Putin since he was prime minister. Well, that was what I was going to ask you. Uh, hindsight certainly makes it obvious that this is a, a fiction in some ways. There's a, he's doing this so that he can rerun again in four years or whatever it is. And I assumed that you all knew that as well, and it created a uh, 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 complications, but maybe yeah. a misunderstanding. No, well, I mean, you know, you learn, at least in my experience with Russia over a year, that there are a few certainties. And so, but I always thought there was a very significant likelihood that Putin was coming back. Um, and it was always clear that he was calling the shots on big issues. He would give Medvedev, you know, some room for maneuver um, on some issues, for example, on the Libya issue. Um, 
but um, in most cases, he was he was calling the shots, both strategically and tactically as well. But it made it awkward in the sense that, you know, from President Obama's point of view, uh, his natural counterpart was President Medvedev. From then Prime Minister Putin's point of view, he didn't see an American vice president as his equal or his counterpart. And so, you know, when the president visited in the summer of 2009, he met with Putin as prime minister. When Hillary Clinton would visit as secretary, she met with Putin. So did Vice President Biden when he visited. But there wasn't that kind of uh, natural, regular channel to Putin um, in those years, which was a complication. And then a, uh, a world events uh, take place, Arab Spring, uh, Libya, obviously, the death of Gaddafi, the, the way Putin reacted to those events and the way he hoped Medvedev would, would respond, but, uh, but he didn't respond exactly the way he wanted and, uh, well, tell me the story. Well, I think, again, for Putin, um, the Arab Spring and the revolutions and upheavals that unfolded from the beginning of 2011 on were of a piece with the color revolutions in the former Soviet Union. And he saw this, again, wrongly, as part of a pattern of American behavior in which what we were bound and determined to do was to undermine regimes that didn't fit our model of what you know government should look like in, in, in a U.S.-led international order. And so he thought that we were naive about the way the Middle East worked and that we didn't understand the consequences of you know, contributing to the undermining of regimes, you know, autocratic regimes that have been there for a long time. He was not someone who understood that it was popular pressures that were producing these things. It wasn't as if the United States threw Mubarak under the bus in Egypt. The bus was already halfway, you know, across Mubarak by the time President Obama said, you know, it was time for a change. Um, but from Putin's point of view, this was all part of a pattern of undermining existing governments, usually authoritarian governments, which bore some similarities to his own, and that ultimately that could threaten his own control in the Kremlin. Um, and then you add to that his sense of naivete and recklessness and his, from his point of view of American policy. Um, and I think he was particularly shaken um, by Gaddafi's fate and the images of, you know, Gaddafi being killed when he was found in a drainage hole someplace. Um, and, you know, he was, he was even more determined after that point to draw a line and find ways in which he could undermine, you know, the ability of the United States to pursue what he saw to be, you know, a mistaken policy line. I suppose if you are a strong man and you see the United States take down Saddam Hussein, a strong man, even when it was not necessary, especially when it was not in his best interest, and you watch you watch the Arab Spring and you watch it happening with strong men everywhere in peril, and then Gaddafi is the capper. And the way people tell us, he's literally watching it on video right. over and over yeah. again, right? Yeah. No, no, it's very consistent with, you know, what I've always understood about Putin. And I think, you know, for someone whose sort of prime focus is control and political order, uh, authoritarian political order, because he's a statist. He believes that's the only way in which you can hold Russia together and ensure Russia's major power role in the world. And that, you know, any kind of examples elsewhere in the world that undermine that kind of a concept, um, you know, are in some ways threatening to him. What happens in Georgia? Uh, what, what was it risk or what was it play? What was he trying to do? And what did he learn from at least the military failure? Well, I think there were um, several things first. I mean, on the military side, again, you know, what shaped Putin's view is the Russian military in the 90s, particularly in the first Chechen war in 94 to 96. You know, here you had what was once the vaunted Red Army that was supposed to be able to reach the English Channel in 48 hours that proved, you know, entirely ineffective in trying to deal with a small rebellion of Chechen, you know, irregular forces as well. And so he was convinced that you had to rebuild Russian military might. What the Georgia war in August of 2008 exposed was that they had made some progress toward, you know, restoring a more modern Russian military, but they still had a long way to go as well. Um, you know, and then on the political side, again, it was Putin's view that Russia was entitled uh, 
to a sphere of influence um, that Georgia, especially under uh, Misha Saakashvili, uh, threatened that. Um, Saakashvili in particular deeply irritated Putin because he saw him as an upstart and as someone who was um, trying to take advantage of Russia. And, you know, Putin, as a, you know, someone who had studied judo for many years, was, you know, a master, I think, at trying to bait his opponents into making a misstep, and then he could counter that, you know, very forcefully. And so he did his best to set Saakashvili up, I think, over the course of the late spring and summer of 2008. But from Putin's point of view, this wasn't just about Georgia. This was about Ukraine. This was about what he saw to be the West's interest in, you know, uh, eventual expansion of NATO, potentially to include um, Ukraine and Georgia. This came against the backdrop also of, you know, U.S. plans to um, establish missile defense cooperation and missile defense sites in Poland and the Czech Republic, which he was also worried about. Um, it came against the backdrop of the war in Kosovo in the late 90s and then the independence of uh, Kosovo, um, you know, just in, just before, in a couple of years before the Georgia war. So from Putin's point of view, this was all part of an encroachment on what he saw to be Russia's interest and sphere of influence. And he saw an opportunity, both a challenge from Saakashvili and Georgia and an opportunity um, to punch him back. As we try to pick up all the strands of things that are happening, when you look at is is cyber war, cyber information warfare, and all of that, and its fledgling days and the Estonia right. attacks, and then how he keeps trying to add, or they keep trying to add some components to it all the way along until you see what happens in Crimea and Ukraine. Did, did, were you guys picking up on this as a as a as an element of what he was building in the toolbox? Yeah, I mean certainly, you know, I was ambassador in Moscow when. Um, you know, the, the cyber conflict that the Russians waged against Estonia was mounted. The Estonian ambassador in Moscow was a good friend of mine, and, you know, she was tormented in a lot of different ways and held her own very well by the Russians in that period. So you could see the Russians investing um, in this instrument of state power. Um, and, you know, it was, from their point of view, um, a kind of perfect asymmetric tool you know, a way in which they couldn't compete in terms of conventional military power and were in many other measures of national power with the United States or NATO, but here was one area where they could punch above their weight and take advantage of the human capital in Russia. Um, and, you know, you could see it building all the way through the Ukraine crisis, which came some years later. When the word gets out that Putin is going to come back and the protests begin in Moscow for real, mm -hmm. uh, First, let's bring Hillary Clinton in and what she said and mm -hmm. why he pointed the finger at her as, a, as part of the cause of what was happening. Well, I think for, first Putin was surprised um, by the breadth and the magnitude of the demonstrations and surprised that this wasn't just about Moscow and St. Petersburg, where, you know, typically you'd see some low-level opposition demonstrations. This was occurring in, you know, cities across Russia. And so he was worried by that and, as I said, surprised. Um, and then Hillary Clinton, you know, spoke the truth. I mean, you know, in terms of what she had to say about the legitimate frustrations of Russians. Um, Putin, you know, partly because this is psychologically, I guess, projection, because this is how he would have done it, assumed that the United States was some way complicit in encouraging those kind of demonstrations, which wasn't the case at all. Um, but it was also convenient for Putin um, to point to outsiders, especially the United States, because gradually, and especially in his second term as president, I think he had come to the conviction that there were two ways in which you could ensure Russia's great power role in the world and ensure his continued control in the Kremlin. And they were first to chip away at a U.S.-led international order to open up space for Russia. Um, and second, it was to point to external threats to help justify a very repressive domestic system. So it suited him to point to Hillary Clinton and to the United States as the agitator, you know, as the originator um, of those kind of demonstrations, which wasn't true, but it was convenient, I think, for Putin. And I think he was also convinced that the United States was um, encouraging, you know, those kind of demonstrations. What, were there conversations 
that you were privy to where she was in, where she thought through what she was going to say, what she should say at a moment like that? Were you worried about if she spoke, what would, you know, or she wrote or she did anything, if the U.S. did no. anything in relation to these? No, I mean, I remember conversations during that period, and I think it's important to be honest about events like that. And I think, you know, what she had to say was fairly measured. It was an honest description of what was happening and an honest criticism of Putin's reaction to that as well. And I think that's, you know, what you expect of an American Secretary of State or an American President. How did they get on, Clinton, P Putin and Clinton? Um, you know, that I, I saw, I think I was at each of the face-to-face -face meetings that they had. I remember <clears throat> the first one um, in Moscow where Putin, as was characteristic with him, when the press came in at the beginning for sort of the initial media availability, he was quite snarky. And so raised, you know, with the press, you know, following all this, you know, a few kind of criticisms of American policy and second guessing of the United States. And, um, you know, she took this in stride and gave as good as she got. And, and you could almost see him taking, you know, his measure of her. And then in the private conversation, which was similarly animated at times, but she didn't back down a bit, which I think, you know, uh, for which Putin developed a kind of grudging respect. Um, but I think um, he felt threatened by her. Um, and by the fact that she clearly did not buy into this notion um, that Russia was entitled to a sphere of influence, that she did not buy into the notion that the United States should be mute about, you know, transgressions against human rights in Russia or any place else in the world. And so he saw that as a threat against the backdrop of his growing concern about the role the United States was playing around the world and, you know, particularly the ways in which his own grip and his own control might be threatened or undermined. How did uh, President Putin feel about President Obama? They, just I, they never uh, developed a lot of rapport. I mean, they're much different personalities. I remember their first meeting in July of 2009 at Putin's dacha, you know, just outside Moscow. And President Obama quite deliberately started the conversation by, you know, essentially giving Putin a chance to um, you know, unburdened himself a little bit about how he had seen relations with the United States over the last decade or more. Um, and th his initial question, about 10 seconds, led to a 45-minute, you know, monologue by, with, by Putin, quite predictably. And Putin unburdened himself about a lot of his concerns about how he thought the United States had um, you know, how its policies and approach to U.S.-Russian relations were unfair. But you know, after that meeting, they didn't have that many opportunities to engage directly, and there was never much direct rapport, and they're much different personalities. He is, at that time, and now too, of course, but is he viewed as a sort of lost cause in that sense, and you want to kind of keep the lid on, but... Putin. Yeah. No, I mean, I think just in my own experience over the last 25, 30 years dealing with Russia, and particularly dealing with Putin's Russia, that it's a mistake to have illusions about grand bargains or great strategic partnerships. There's too much of a fundamental disconnect in terms of the way in which Putin looks at the world and Russia's role and America's role in the world and the way in which any American president, I think, is going to look at it as well. Um, so, but, you know, you don't have the luxury of, or of ignoring Russia either or neglecting it simply because on too many significant issues, they're a significant player. So, you know, on Iran, for example, when Obama came into office at the beginning of 2009, Obama and Clinton recognized that if we were going to get anywhere in building leverage against the Iranians on the nuclear issue and building a solid international coalition in negotiations, um, we had to work with the Russians. Because, you know, we could be pretty confident that we work well with the Germans, the French, and the British. The Chinese weren't playing a you know, particularly active role in that period. So the key was preventing the Iranians from driving a wedge between us and the Russians. And so, you know, that was, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, President Obama wanted to explore the reset. And I think one of the reasons that the president was successful ultimately in reaching a negotiated agreement on the nuclear issue was the Iranians was because we had invested early on in cooperation on this one particular issue, cold-bloodedly in our interest as well as in Russian interests, in trying to build some form of U.S. cooperation at the core of that. And, you know, we worked hard at that.
Russians did as well, and it produced something. It wasn't enough to make the reset a kind of enduring reality because you didn't have any economic ballast in the relationship. There was just there were just too many conflicting, um, you know, interests at stake. But on particular issues like that, you could make some progress. Let's go to 2014. If there mm -hmm. was ever a year in Putin's President Putin's life that if, if you could only make one film about Putin's life, 2014 is a pretty good year yeah, when you think yeah. about what happens in there. You begin with Sochi, right? Crimea, Ukraine, you know, right. all of it, and it's your last year there, right? Uh, so take me there. Start with the Olympics and tell me yeah, the no, arc right. of what you saw happen. Well, you know, Putin had invested heavily in the Sochi Olympics. I mean, I remember going back to the time when I was ambassador and Russia was bidding to host the Olympics. Putin had thrown himself into this. He had polished his English so he could deliver the 10-minute speech or whatever it was to the International Olympic Committee in English. And this was a big triumph personally for him and for Russia to be able to host put enormous amounts of money, tens of billions of dollars, so much of which was wasted and went into the wrong pockets in, you know, uh, building an, a winter Olympic site in Sochi, which is a complicated thing to do since, you know, you're, you've got mountains there, but you've also got, you know, palm trees by the Black Sea as well. So it's kind of an unusual place to do the Winter Olympics. But he was heavily invested in this. I led the U.S. delegation to the closing ceremony at the Winter Olympics. And, you know, it was the kind of pageantry which Putin and Russians in general loved. He was riding very high. This was, you know, a moment of personal and national triumph from his point of view. I think he was surprised um, when President Yanukovych in Ukraine kind of fled the political landscape. He had always, in my experience, had a very dim view of Yanukovych. He thought he was a weakling. And his view of, you know, here's how you deal with demonstrators in the Maidan in Kyiv, you know, you shoot a few of them, and that's how you deter people. And he thought Yanukovych was not weak enough, or was not strong enough uh, to cope with that. So I think he was surprised uh, by the pace of events, the speed with which Yanukovych kind of abandoned the scene. Um, and then he responded in the only way I think that he knew how, and the only way that he thought would work in support of Russia's interests where, you know, if you talk about a Russian sphere of influence, Ukraine was kind of the reddest of red lines from Putin's point of view. And I'm sure in the Kremlin there were contingency plans that had already been developed for, you know, retaking Crimea. Not that I think Putin was planning on that happening, you know, at that period and at that moment in history. Um, but you can see quickly, you know, how he came to the conclusion that Russia had to act decisively to assert its interests and swallowing up Crimea in a blatant act of Russian aggression was the obvious conclusion for him. Were you surprised uh, that, uh, not only at the speed but at the timing of when it happened or did you have an inkling that when? I, I, I was not surprised that Putin uh, responded, um, you know, very strongly um, because I think, you know, given what he saw to be at stake in Ukraine um, and, and the impact that that would have on, you know, his own control in Russia as he saw it, um, it was not a surprise at all that he responded quite forcefully. Um, you know, the way in which he went about it, the little green men and hybrid warfare and everything else was kind of interesting to watch as well because it was very cleverly done. Tell me about it. What happened? Well, I mean, you know, what Putin was able to do was translate a kind of big lie, you know, that Russia wasn't behind any of this, but he was, he was able to employ means, you know, people without, you know, who were, I think, obviously, you know, Russian service people, but, you know, didn't bear any insignia or anything else. And he was able to camouflage that, at least, you know, in sort of international public view, although it was obvious, you know, who was responsible for all this as well. So he was able to sow just enough confusion um, to get away with this in the short term. And for all the vulnerabilities of the Russian military, in that particular theater in Crimea, you know, it was difficult to respond quickly against that for the Ukrainian military as well. He had a lot of advantages there. So that in the uh, southeastern parts of Ukraine, 
when they're not really Russian soldiers, but Facebook is delivering pictures of young Russians with guns, right. saying, right. you know, to their, hey, mom, I'm, look where I am, right? Right, and these are, you know, allegedly, you know, to the most that Putin would admit, as I recall in that period, was that they were, you know, Russian service people who took leave patriotically to go to the Donbass or go to Crimea. Um, which was all BS, but, you know, it was part of a carefully calculated strategy to mask Russia's continuing military weaknesses, even though they had, you know, significantly modernized their military, but to take advantage of a variety of other means in which, you know, they could, they could succeed, at least in those narrow terms. On March 18th, 2014, he delivers the stunning, almost declaration of war uh, speech uh, Take me there. Tell me what it was about. What did you think when you heard and read it? Well, I mean, I think it was, again, I think you have to draw a line back, it, again, in understanding Putin, at least, almost a decade before, to the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. And Putin's growing sense, of first, that the United States and the West was um, out to deny Russia what he saw to be its entitlement terms of a sphere of influence, that the United States and the West was ultimately aiming at undermining his regime, his grip on power. Again, I think totally unjustifiably, but I think he gradually convinced himself of this. And so then you saw this period punctuated by the Munich speech in early 2007, and I think you can draw you know, a straight line all the way through um, you know, to, to that Crimea speech, which was his most um, animated, pugnacious declaration um, that, you know, Russia was going to push back. You know, it was no longer the 98-pound weakling of the 1990s and Yeltsin's period, and it had means in which to protect what he saw to be its interests. And it was defiant, it was unapologetic, um, and, you know, really worrisome in a lot of ways, too, because it made clear the challenge that Putin's Russia was posing. And there was a lot at stake in that period, too, because one of the fundamental tenets of you know, any international order is that big countries don't get to swallow, swallow up parts of small countries just because they can. So there was a lot at stake there as well. At the State Department, take me there when this is happening. Do you, are you in Washington when this happens, or are you? Well, in I was in I was in Sochi first, and then I actually went and stopped in Kiev on the way back to Washington. Um, you know, this was you know partly to reassure the Ukrainian government, partly to reinforce the president's message that the United States and our you know Western partners took this extremely seriously, um, and we're going to push back, and we're certainly we're going to support the Ukrainians as they resisted this aggression. Um, and then I came back to Washington. So by that point, it was, you know, a couple of days after the annexation of Crimea. And uh, what's the vibe in Washington? How, how nervous are people about what he's doing? As I recall, I mean, it was the, the vibe was more one of determination, you know, that this an appreciation first of what was at stake and the moment. Um, that in some ways, you know, as dangerous and reckless as Putin had been in swallowing up Crimea, and then, you know, you could already see what he was at least flirting with in the Donbas in southeastern Ukraine, you know, traditionally an area where there's a big ethnic Russian or Russian-speaking population. And clearly some of the people around Putin were flirting with the notion that there was a step beyond Crimea that you could take. It was, you know, the time when people were in Moscow were talking about, I think, Novaya Rossiya, you know, the, or no, I forget the term, I'll come back to it. But, um, but you know, that this, the, the, Crimea might not be the last stop. Um, and so there was a, a real air of determination, as I recall it, uh, a sense that the best way to push back against the Russians was to do it you know, uh, in, you know, strong, um, you know, alliance with our European partners and starting with the Germ Germans and others. Um, and that, you know, Russia had a lot of vulnerabilities, especially economically. And, you know, we had the means um, to target some of those vulnerabilities in response. Um, that it was extremely important not only not to accept the annexation, um, but to draw a fairly sharp line so that whatever notions some in the Kremlin may have had about the Donbass and, you know, extending Russian control even beyond the Crimea, um, you know, would be set aside. And as the fighting is continuing down in, in Ukraine in the eastern and southeastern sections, there's a 
and there's, there's certainly arguments coming from people at the DOD that say we need more lethal, we need to supply the Ukrainians with you know, weaponry and other things that can at least stop them from getting run over or slaughtered. Uh, Take me there to that. that yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there were a number of vulnerabilities that the Ukrainians faced. Some of them were economic, and we moved quickly along with European Union partners to help address some of those. Some were political, just to give Ukrainians a sense that, you know, the West was behind them in resisting Russian aggression, and some were military and security. I think, um, you know, the Ukrainians, after some initial setbacks, because they were overwhelmed in some ways militarily, um, proved to be quite determined um, fighters and so had begun to kind of stabilize the front um, in southeastern Ukraine in that period. But there was a powerful argument for not just providing defensive weaponry, the sorts of things that, you know, we and others were providing the Ukrainians, but thinking about, you know, other kinds of weaponry, anti-tank weapons and others that, you know, the Ukrainians, um, you know, might be able to employ even more effectively. It's a complicated calculation for President Obama in that period. First, because you didn't want to give the Russians any excuses to overreach even further than they already were. Second, it was clear that some of our closest European allies had some misgivings about doing this then. Um, and you know, I think the essence of what the president was trying to do was to ensure that this was a kind of cohesive, unified transatlantic response to the Russians. And so, you know, he understandably wanted to be careful about making decisions that might give Putin a chance to exploit differences between us and some of the Europeans. So that, that was a factor as well. Um, but there was a pretty compelling argument for trying to provide some of that kind of weaponry early on. Lessons learned by uh, President Putin from what happened in Crimea and uh, and uh, and what is happening in Ukraine? Um, well, first, from Putin's point of view, um, you know the the most important the the best thing is to have a deferential government in Kiev. If you can't have that, the next best thing is a dysfunctional Ukraine, and that's what he's been trying to do ever since the annexation of Crimea. Um, is take advantage of you know vulnerabilities in Ukraine, and he knows where a lot of the skeletons are buried. So it's extremely important, it seems to me, first to understand what his calculus is and then resist that first by helping the Ukrainians rebuild themselves economically and politically. And I think what Putin has accomplished strategically is a net loss for Russia in the sense that he's ensured that the vast majority of Ukrainians, even including lots of you know, ethnic Russian Ukrainians, now have no interest in being a kind of vassal state of Russia. You know, their commitment to a sovereign, independent Ukraine is stronger, certainly a lot stronger than it was before 2014. Um, and so I think the broader lessons with Putin are don't underestimate him, that <clears throat> you have to be vigilant, that he understands firmness, um, that you have to anticipate sometimes, you know, where he might try to take advantage because he's constantly demonstrating that declining powers can be at least as disruptive as rising powers in the world. And again, you know, going back to his judo training from when he was 11 or 12, you know, one of the things he learned in judo is that, you know, you can take advantage of stronger opponents by, you know, waiting for them to make a misstep or seeing opportunities or seeing weaknesses. And that's what he did in Ukraine after the crisis started. That's what he did in Syria in you know, roughly the same time period or a little bit later. Um, that's what he did in the U.S. elections as well. And, and for him, it almost seems like when you think about it, he doesn't need to win whatever win means in any of these events, these wars. He just has to have chaos, disruption, right. Uh, keep yeah. everybody at bay in some other way. I think that's right. I mean, you know, if Putin's goal, like lots of people in the Russian political elite, is to restore Russia as a major power, rebuild it after, again, the period of historic weakness in the 90s, there are at least two different ways of doing that. One is to modernize your economy, to build a strong state that relies not just on hydrocarbons, but on the human capital in Russia, open up to the rest of the world. Um, he's chosen not to do that because that, in his judgment, would come at the expense of what matters most to him, which is political control. You open up the economy, 
you, you know, apply rule of law to the way in which your economy functions, ultimately that's going to affect your political system. And it also means you'd have to fight corruption in a serious way, and corruption is what he uses to lubricate his political system. So the second alternative in, in an international order led by the United States is to chip away um, at the U.S. position in that order, make common cause where you can, whether it's with China or Iran in the Middle East or other places, you know, other states that may not have an identical view of the world as Putin does, but, you know, where you can make common cause at chipping away at the American role. Um, and, and, you know, that's the path essentially that he's chosen. It's convenient also because it enables him to point to external threats to Russia, real or imagined, and to demonstrate that, you know, he's the Russian leader who can stand up effectively to those. And again, he's demonstrated that even if you're, objectively speaking, a declining power, um, you know, you can be quite disruptive and you can sow chaos. And I'm convinced that's exactly what he intended to do in the U.S. elections in 2016 and su has succeeded so far beyond his wildest imagination um, in sowing chaos. In some respects, in, you know, making President Trump an instrument of that chaos, um, you know, I think his calculation, given his dim view of Hillary Clinton, was probably that she was going to win the election, but he wanted to hobble her if he could so that she'd come into office, which he probably expected, um, but in a weaker position and distracted by, you know, continuing domestic debates and partisan debates. Um, I don't think Putin has had any great illusions about doing a grand bargain with the Trump administration. He tends to take a fairly cynical view of, you know, how you deal with the United States. But from his point of view, being able to sow chaos, being able to distract the United States, being able to, in his eyes, expose the hypocrisy of the American political system to the rest of the world is that obviously a net plus. That opens up a lot of room for maneuver in Russia and the world. It is not a long-term prescription for sustaining Russia as a great power, as a major power, in part because he's not invested in his economy in a way that's going to fuel that over time. But in the short term, you know, it's opened up a lot of possibilities for him. Just fabulous. Let, let's ask these guys what we missed. In the, after Ukraine, when the sort of Western countries respond, but maybe not as forceful as they might have, um, not providing lethal weapons, uh -huh. does, does Putin learn something there that might embolden him later, that might make him think he can do something like intervene in an American election without uh, serious consequences? consequences? Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think Putin was actually to some extent surprised by the solidarity of the U.S. and our principal European allies. I think he was surprised by the sharpness of the sanctions uh, especially after the first wave of sanctions, the next waves, and the impact that they had on the Russian elite, people around him, and also Russia's ability to access capital and to access the kind of technology that it needs in developing hydrocarbon reserves too. So I think he underestimated, you know, what the, the backlash was going to be. I think he also underestimated the impact this was going to have on Ukraine, you know, over the medium term, you know, deepening a sense of solidarity on the part of Ukrainians as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it didn't diminish his interest in looking for opportunities in other places or vulnerabilities, whether it was Syria or in the U.S. elections. But I think he was going to try to take advantage of them anyway, um, you know, notwithstanding the way in which Ukraine unfolded. Did you ever hear from him personally about his view of U.S. interference, of uh, sort of his theories about what the U.S. was doing in his sphere of influence or his description of the president or the secretary of state? In the current administration or? No, um, when you were there. Yeah, I mean, I remember um, one conversation that um, uh, Secretary Rice had with Putin, um, I think it was in the fall of 2006, so probably before the Munich speech, in which Putin got quite animated about, you know, his concerns about Ukraine and Georgia um, and, you know, the way in which he would respond um, if, um, you know, the Ukrainian and Georgian leaderships were, in his view, to push things too far. Um, and so, yeah, no, I saw a number of instances where, you know, Putin was uh, 
quite upfront and quite adamant uh, about his positions in private, you know, coupled with uh, public expressions in Munich and, and elsewhere. So, you know, he, he was not shy uh, about expressing the depth of his concerns. My last one, and then, okay. uh, Jim, when, when you meet him first time in the 1990s, mm -hmm. do you have a sense then of, of who he is, or who does he, who's the guy who you meet the, the very first time? No, I mean, I think, um, as I recall, I had two encounters, you know, in, in groups in which uh, I was on the U.S. side and Putin was a part of the Russian group, both when he was working as the deputy mayor for uh, Mayor Sobchak in Leningrad and later St. Petersburg. One when I was uh, working for Secretary Baker, uh, so it would have been 91 or 92, and then a second when I was the political counselor at our embassy in Moscow and had another encounter with Sobchak. But I don't, I don't, it was only later that, you know, I connected the dots, so I wish I could say I had the prescience, you know, to see that Putin was going to emerge as the Russian leader that he later emerged as, but I, I remember you know, being in the same meeting room, but I don't remember him saying anything. And, uh, you know, the encounters were not especially memorable. But who was he then? He wasn't a, he didn't seem like a guy on, who was gonna be the next president. No, and I don't think that was, uh, I don't think that occurred to Putin either at that time too. I mean, his rise was remarkable and in some ways a function of, you know, the chaos of Russia in the 1990s, in, in Yeltsin's Russia, you know, he had, left the KGB, uh, become, you know, vice mayor to Sobchak in, in Leningrad and then St. Petersburg. Um, and then in a span of, you know, two or three years, rose from being, you know, one of the deputy heads of administration in the Kremlin, um, you know, to becoming the head of the FSB, the successor to the KGB, um, uh, prime minister and eventually the president of Russia, uh, all in a very, you know, rapid, uh, period of time. Why? What was it? You know, I don't, I don't know. I think, you know, from the point of view of Yeltsin, who, you know, was rapidly declining in terms of his health and his political grip, and Yeltsin's family and the people around him, they needed first and foremost to try to groom a successor who would protect them, um, you know, who wasn't going to then unleash you know, the instruments of the state uh, against them. And so I think they found Putin to be, you know, a reliable instrument. Um, he he wasn't associated with one faction or another at that time, um, but it was quite remarkable how quickly, you know, he emerged in that period as from the sort of grayest of gray personalities to, you know, becoming the president of Russia. When you hear that the Russian government, uh, you know, it was probably around the summer, late fall mm -hmm. of 2016, that the uh, Russian government was involved in hacking and mm -hmm. releasing documents mm -hmm. and seeming to influence an American election, um, how surprised were you? What was your response? How unprecedented was that? Um, I wasn't entirely surprised um, because you had seen the Russians developing this capability um, for some years. Um, I, I was a little bit surprised by the brazenness of it as well. Um, you know, Putin didn't go to great lengths to try to cover his tracks on this. Um, and, you know, I was struck like so many other Americans by the seriousness of this, a, a direct challenge to the democratic system in the United States. And I think that's something that, you know, has to be taken really seriously. And when you see uh, candidate Trump respond in that moment, what? I, I, mean, I was appalled, first of all, by the unwillingness to appreciate what was at stake here. Um, that this was a serious effort by Russia, by a foreign power to interfere in our elections, which is as, you know, as direct uh, and severe a threat to American interests as you can imagine. And his, you know, sort of public efforts to be dismissive of that at best or to encourage it at worst, I think really were appalling. Some people who've come in here and talked to us say, you, you have to understand, He's at war with us. It's not mm -hmm. a war like a shooting war mm -hmm. yet, but it's a war and it's an ongoing war and we have to acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I think uh, it's, you know, certainly, certainly it's an adversarial relationship and I think Putin approaches that relationship in that way and he's going to employ whatever means he can uh, 
um, to undermine the United States. It doesn't mean he's going to be oblivious to those few areas where we might be able to work together. He's capable of, you know, juggling apparent contradictions at the same time. But I think you do under, have to understand that this is, you know, for some years to come, going to be largely an adversarial relationship. Thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure.